unconsecrated ground, Hollyrod, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Jim Kern's ghost proved the adage that one ha had better follow a dying man's wishes or face the consequences. Curran told his son-in-law, James Butler, that he wanted to be buried in the new cemetery on Hollyrod's south side, even though it wasn't technically open as of yet. If you don't, Curran said, I will return and give you not a moment's peace. Curran died just before Christmas. Butler passed along his father-in-law's request for a burial in the new cemetery to Father Walsh. Impossible, the pastor pronounced. I won't hear of such a thing. The cemetery is not conserated. We'll bury Mr. Curran on the north side, and if he, he's set to come forth and haunt anyone, let it be me. Butler said that would be fine, as long as the ghost didn't come to visit him. Jim Curran was laid to rest on a snowy afternoon shortly after Christmas. Father Walsh and his driver made for home, which was Harbor, Maine. The snowstorm got worse, and the men found the road blocked. They took a path across the pond, but wandered for three hours before they found their way back. Father Walsh's driver, a superstitious fellow named Harry, was badly rattled. It's Jim Curran's ghost, what let us wrong, he swore. Father Walsh heard grumblings along, among his congregation that maybe the old man should have been buried in the new cemetery. In church the next Sunday, the priest explained his reasons for not allowing anyone to be buried in the south side graveyard until it was blessed. He would take more convincing, it seemed. Later that night, Walsh heard a knock at his front door. He opened it to find no one there, but he did hear distinct footsteps cross the threshold, walk across the floor, and fence up the stairs to the bedroom. Another priest in the region, Father O'Donnell, came to visit the next day. He inquired about the visitor Father Walsh had received the previous night. Walsh denied anyone had been there, but Father O'Donnell said he knew better. That was enough for Father Walsh. He ordered the cemetery opened immediately. The first order of business was the exhumation of John Curran's body from his north side grave and reburial in the new cemetery. The old man who was disobeyed had rested sincerely ever since. Baldoonigans, Baldoon, Ontario. Old John MacDonald had a farm, a haunted farm, and a most famous one in Canadian ghost lore. The sleepy hamlet of Baldoon in southern Ontario rarely saw activity of any sort in 1829. But when Father MacDonald Farmer MacDonald came into town to report what was happening at his place. The rest of the frontier Canada soon took notice. MacDonald said supernatural forces had nearly succeeded in destroying his family. What he had was the work of a poltergeist. Large chunks of timber were flying around his barn. Soon, pots, pans, and other household objects were being hurled through the air without any sign of human assistance. Small projectiles with Mrs. MacDonald called witch balls pounded against the outside walls. The poltergeist fired objects inside and outside the house on an almost daily basis. The intensity of the peltings varied, but rarely let up entirely. Sightseers flocked to the farm to see for themselves the strange phenomenon. A few said they heard strange moans that seemed to come from everywhere yet nowhere. For a long three years, the poltergeist kept up its antics. The McDonald's grew increasingly despondent. They tried all sorts of methods to rid their farm of the haunting, even calling in a witch hunter, but to no avail. The phenomenon stopped without explanation in 1831. Nothing more was seen, felt, or heard of the Baldoon poltergeist. The McDonald's resumed their quiet, rural life. It remains one of Canada's enduring supernatural mysteries. Close Encounters, Vancouver, British Columbia It sounded like a voice, a wail, someone in deepest agony, yet it wasn't quite human, not like any human they'd ever heard. The family thought it might be their little dog, whining in a most singular way. That is until the night when they heard the yowl at the same time saw the dog cowering and at the foot of the bed. Then they knew something else was in their house, and they didn't want any part of it. The nine children lived with their fisherman father in a house they'd occupied for 24 years. The mother had recently passed away. It was summer 1978. An official of Vancouver Psychic Society, Linda Clore, learned about the story. She said the family first heard the alarming noise in the middle of the night, but it seemed more like a voice than a noise. On the second occasion, the family mistakenly thought their dog was the source of the problem. They also heard the voice utter a word that sounded like die or why. When it happened on a third night, father and children decided to spend the night elsewhere. A tape recorder was left on, however, to pick up any sounds in the, in the empty house. Their dog also remained behind. Linda Clore told reporters that the recorder taped the dog's barks, but also what sounded like someone in deep agony. And whatever the entity was, it was using the energy of that dog's bark. The distressed voice on the tape was not only the noise recorded. Heavy footsteps pounded across the floor, rattling glasses on every table. 
Clore and another medium visited the house. They sensed a man present, a very confused entity, but one whom they could not otherwise identify. The house seemed to quiet down after that. There was a final wailing sound, but then silence. Clore reported that electronic analysis of the tape found the voice was not human. She said there did not seem to be an explanation for the events. Children of the Night, Montreal, Quebec. Sometimes it is better not to question Providence. Yet the intervention of coincidence or chance or God or whatever one chooses to call it is not always heeded by prudent men and women. Such was the case in the 19th century Montreal at a municipal facility that housed incurable children. Built in 1805 in the design of a secure but homey structure, the place was soon struck with tragedy. Two children killed the director and his wife and set the house ablaze to cover up their crime. They were soon apprehended and put on trial for murder. They were quickly found guilty of their slangs and they were hanged. That should have been the end of this particular brutality, but it wasn't. The house was rebuilt on its original foundation and passed from owner to owner for the next hundred years. If it is possible for a locale to be haunted by past events, this is one of those cases. Murder, suicide, and more unexplained fires plagued the numerous habitats of this cursed house. Zones of frigid air suddenly sprang up in the warmest of its rooms. In 1905, author Paul Fortier, his pretty young wife Denise, and their lovely five-year-old daughter Giselle bought the home and moved in. They knew little of its history. They should have been more careful. Frontier's novel, Fields of Aramath, had just been published to the generally positive reviews. He had nearly completed a second book and was looking forward to spending his writing career in the distinctive old house. Denise Fortier was the first to discover the true legacy of the home. Its role in a heinous crime early in the last century was well known in the neighborhood, and perhaps to the real estate agents as well, but everyone failed to warn the Fortiers. Perhaps this was an accident, perhaps it was something more. At any rate, when Denise spoke to the neighbors about their home, the story of its past settled heavily on her conscience. She, grew, she had grown more apprehensive with each passing week. Then her little daughter Giselle became affected. The child barely slept through the night, her bedroom seemed afflicted with gnawing cold spots. Perhaps, too, she sensed her mother's increasingly anxious moods. The poor talk could do little but worry that Ma Mère was upset about something. Denise's visit with her parish priest did little to absolve her of the gnawing fear. He thought the strain of keeping up the large house was too much for her. When, he asked, when she asked him to exercise her home, he sent her away with more than a little skepticism in his dismissive tone. Denise came home from the church with the almost palpable understanding palpable understanding that on this night there, some, there would come something truly horrible. Paul seemed especially churlish at dinner. He consumed nearly a bottle of wine and spoke, too little, spoke little to either his wife or his daughter. His behavior had changed since moving into the house, and he had snapped at Denise whenever she tried to broach the subject of his erratic behavior. He just laughed when she tried to point out those rooms in the house that seemed unnaturally cold, or those in which there seemed to be several pairs of eyes watching her every move. She hardly dared mention those other times when she heard childish laughter that sent chills as cold as the grave itself inside through and through her entire body. The evening was a disaster. Denise knew better than to let Giselle linger too long in such an atmosphere. She carried the child up to bed, whispering all the while that the bright morning sun would cheer them all. Giselle shook her head. She held her mother tight, begging her to take her away from the house that night. A cold spot had been in her bed last night, she cried. She was afraid it would come back. Denise tucked the child in and kissed her goodnight. Giselle had held on to her mother with all her might she could muster in her tiny arms. It was as if to let her mother go would mean the end of her small family. The events of the next few hours were eventually pieced together from Giselle's tortured memories and the testimony of a few witnesses. <clears throat> Some hours after she fell asleep, Giselle woke to the smell of smoke. There were no flames visible, nor any sense of extreme heat. She ran down the hallway. Smoke was coming from beneath her parents' bedroom door. She pushed the door open. The bedroom was an inferno, but there was a more, th more than a horrible sight. Her father's lifeless body sprawled on the floor, a pair of scissors buried in his throat. Only the bloodied handles were visible. Giselle's eyes shifted to the bed where her frenzied mother was fighting off two small, naked boys who were shaking with soundless laughter as they drove their fists into Denise's bruised and bloody face. Giselle ran next door for help. When the neighbors arrived, the scene was not at all as she had breathlessly related to them. Yes, Paul Fortier's remains were on the floor and Denise was barely conscious on the bed, but there was no fire, no frenzied naked boys, no smell of smoke. Only the indisputable signs of a murderous quarrel between husband and wife. Denise had apparently fought off her husband's attack by stabbing him in self-defense with scissors. That was the verdict of the police anyway. 
They dismissed Giselle's account as the sad result of having seen her mother kill her father. Denise lived for, lived for several months before succumbing to her critical injuries. She never regained consciousness. Giselle Fortier moved away to the United States to live with her grandparents. The Fortiers were the last family to live in the damned house. It burned to the ground for the last time in 1906.